Hi, I'm Jesse. Let's have our devotion. We're in Acts chapter 12, beginning in verse 20. Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. Together, they presented themselves before him. After winning over Blastus, who was in charge of the king's bedroom, they asked for peace because their country was supplied with food from the king's country. On an appointed day, dressed in royal robes and seated on the throne, Herod delivered a speech to them. The assembled people began to shout, It's the voice of a god and not of a man. At once, an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give the glory to God, and he was eaten by worms and died. The Word of God. Does that bless you today? This is God's will for Herod. We saw him sentence the two soldiers to death who were guarding, uh, who, were, who were guarding Peter's prison cell. Oh, sorry, I said two. It doesn't say exact, exactly the number. This is now Herod before the people of Tyre and Sidon. Okay, T-Y-R-E. We've seen this place before, especially in Old Testament prophecy. When you see Ezekiel speak to the king of Tyre, there are these striking, striking parallels between the king of Tyre and Satan himself, where the king of Tyre was a real dude. And then Satan is an angel of light, given this post uh, in, the, uh, in the presence of God. And you can see these parallels between the king of Tyre and uh, the devil, the story of Lucifer becomes Satan. Tyre and Sidon were immediately adjacent cities. And they're going to come up elsewhere within prophetic scripture. But the people of Tyre and Sidon would answer to Herod. Together they presented themselves before him. This is on an appointed day, according to verse 21, when Herod would dress up in his royal robes and sit on the throne, and he would deliver a speech to his people. And as he's speaking to the people, they shout back, it's the voice of a God and not of a man. Here's what I want to zoom in on. Tomorrow we're going to talk about God striking him dead for claiming the divine accolades that are, that are sent his way or not refuting them. But today I want to talk about some of the strategic infiltration that takes place in this text. Did you see this in verse, uh, in verse 20? After winning over Blastus, who was in charge of the king's bedroom, they asked for peace because their country was supplied with food from the king's country. These people were smart. They were able to influence key figures, even, even as intimately connected with Herod as the, as the guys who oversaw the king's bedroom. Okay, Blastus is a guy who is right there to help make sure that Herod's Netflix subscription is paid for and working. And that this guy is right there and he's in a key position. We've seen the LGBTQIAAP plus community do the exact same thing. Uh, we've seen them occupy positions of key influence in order to influence academia, uh, to join school boards and city councils and run for office. And even though statistically they would comprise an incredibly small, like single digit, far less than 5% of the population, I'm talking like two and a half percent of the population, just wielded control in such a way that influenced legislation all the way up to the highest court in the land in 2015, Obergefell. All right, that, that is key influence right there. And this is something that's out of fashion for Christians. I want us to see what God does as history unfolds. You're not going to see a whole lot of it happen in the book of Acts, but you will see some key figures who are saved thereafter. But you'll see, you'll see people of the Christian worldview in key influential positions put there by God sovereignly for such a time as this. There's a school of thought called theonomy, and I'd love for you, if you have time, to, to look into this. Uh, the idea of theonomy is that our laws come from God. Now there's some iterations of theonomy that I don't think do a very good job of encapsulating the, the intent behind it. And it sounds kind of like, go take Old Testament Israel law and make that the law of the nation and live as a theocracy. That's not, that's not actually what theonomy is about. Rather, in a nutshell, our laws come from God. As Christians, we know where laws come from. We're acquainted with the source. And so it is not in our nation's best interest or our society's best interest or our school board's best interests for us to check 
our rational faith at the door and come in and pretend to be these Orwellian vessels for secular thought. That's not what separation of church and state means. Separation of church and state actually protects the church from the state. So if God has laid it on your heart to run for public office, to influence school board decisions, to run for city council, good grief do we need you here in Seattle. If God has laid it on your heart to get into politics, this there's a reason for this. Having people in key influential positions is always good insofar as it pertains to the goodness of that person's worldview. All governing authorities, all justice systems will stand before the justice of God one day. But in the meantime, if God's laid it on your heart as a Christian to run for public office, even say here in liberal Seattle, please, please do so. Because ultimately, a theonomist or not, you know where law comes from. And if you're in key positions, such as Blastus' position right here, then you're in a, in a position to be able to share the gospel in a dark place that lights up the darkness the very most. This is the book of Acts, and it's unfolding before us. Now it's your turn. You and I have inherited the torch that was lit by the flame of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Now what will you do with that? Our prayer is that you would carry it forward and go live out the book of Acts. You ready?